Chapter 1, Food and Freedom It was early morning, the streets were empty. Duva took his little brother by the hand and said, Come on, Srulik, let's cross to the Polish side. How? Like the smugglers, I've seen them. They crawl through a hole in the wall in back of the house across the street. Srulik was excited. He and his brother, who wasn't much older than him, didn't always agree, but this idea he liked. What's on the Polish side? Food and freedom. Srulik knew what food was. What's freedom, he asked. That's where there's no wall and you can walk as far as you want and no one stops you, Duvid said. Some of my friends have left the ghetto through the gate. They wait for a German soldier who looks nice and run to the Polish side. Did you ever do that, Srulik asked? No, going through the wall is better. But how do you get food on the Polish side? You beg for money and buy food with it at a grocery. The groceries have everything, like Panny Staniex and Blani before the war. Candy too? Candy too. Srulik was a redhead with freckles, blue eyes, and a winning smile. Even after hard times began in the early days of the German occupation of Poland in World War II, he had secretly used that smile to coax change from his father to buy candy at Panny Staniak's grocery store. But now his father had no more change. All right, he said. Let's go. There's just one thing, his brother said. We have to watch out for the tough Polish kids. What will they do to us? Beat us up? Bad? Pretty bad. Do you still want to come? Yes, Srulik said without hesitating. They ducked through a hole in the wall. Two grinning Polish boys were waiting on the other side of it. We'd better go back, Duvid said. Srulik wished they didn't have to. Not just because of the candy. He missed the other things even more. The being able to walk all you wanted the way he could when they had their own house in the town of Blani. Duvid and Srulik's parents heard of the route through the wall and decided to escape from the ghetto and return to Blani. Maybe some Polish friends there would agree to hide them. A year and a half ago... A year and a half had gone by since they were forced to leave the village. It had been a grim time. Anything would be better than slow death from starvation in the ghetto in Warsaw. It was decided that Srulik, with his father and mother, would go first. If they made it, Duvid would follow with his older brother and sister. They would know their parents were in Blani because they would get a postcard that said, We haven't heard from you for ages. Drop us a line, Yasik. Yasik, Srulik's father, said was just a Polish name. Srulik remembered the town well. They had lived there together, his parents, his uncle, his grandfather, and his four brothers and sisters. In a house with one large room, his uncle and his older sister, Fag, had escaped across the border to Russia when the war with Germany broke out. His grandfather was taken to the hospital one day and never came back. Duvid guided his parents and Srulik to the opening in the wall. They said goodbye to him and crossed through it. The morning sun was already high in the sky. The streets of Warsaw looked normal. If not for an occasional German soldier, you wouldn't have known there was a war. Go slow, Srulik's father told them. Make believe we're just out for a walk. Don't look at the German soldiers. Don't even look at the Polish policemen. Make believe we do this every day. Srulik couldn't resist looking at everything. The display windows of the stores, the well-dressed mothers with their baby carriages, the cars, the electric trolleys, the horse-drawn coaches. Yes, the soldiers and the policemen too. His father and mother looked straight ahead. They forced themselves to behave like any two parents taking a walk with their small son. Finally, they reached the outskirts of the city. Srulik was overjoyed. Everything made him smile. The green fields, the flowers growing by the roadside, the cows and horses grazing in the grass, the big blue sky that stretched to the horizon, where a thin black line marked the edge of Kampanowski Forest. It was just like before the war. Suddenly, three German soldiers on motorcycles came speeding toward them. Srulik's father jumped into a ditch by the side of the road. He and his mother dived for the other side. His father got away. The Germans caught him and his mother, put them in the sidecar, and brought them to the Getzebo. His mother was given a whipping, and they were returned to the ghetto. Srulik's mother lay for a long while in bed. His father didn't return. It took two weeks for Srulik's mother to recover enough to go foraging with him again in the ghetto's garbage bins. Removing the lid from a bin, she picked, up, picked him up and lowered him into it, even though he told her he could do it by himself. He even showed her how, with the help of a running start, he could grab the rim of the bin and vault over. This was easier when it was made of bricks. The metal cans were harder. You don't get as dirty when I help you, his mother answered. Mama, what difference does that make? Srulik asked. Still, he thought maybe she was right. The work demanded concentration. 
When his arms didn't reach all the way into the garbage, he used a stick or a broken board. He looked for the peels of potatoes, carrots, beets, and apples, and sometimes found old moldy bread. Everything went into a straw basket that he handed to his mother. At home, she picked out what was edible and cooked it. Although each family received food rations, these were too small to keep them alive. And in winter, the garbage froze and was hard to handle. It was better once he found a pair of torn woolen gloves and his mother mended them for him. Now, though it was a hot June day and Srulik was already eight years old, the trouble with the summer was that the garbage smelled bad and the flies kept buzzing around his head. You couldn't tell them that they'd be better off looking in the garbage. It took something unusually smelly to attract their attention. There were ordinary flies and there were green bottles with his brother David called death flies. Today, nothing smelled that bad and there was no way of keeping the flies off of him. The basket was full, Mama, he called, ready to hand it to her. There was no answer. His hands took the basket. He stood up and peered out of the garbage bin. Some boys were playing soccer near the ghetto wall that cut the street in half. Srulik jumped from the bin and ran along the street, looking for his mother. For a second he thought that was a woman sitting hunched on the stoop was her, but it wasn't. He ran back to the garbage bin. Perhaps she had run away from a policeman and come back. Someone was standing there, emptying a pail of garbage. It wasn't his mother. She had vanished as, the, as, as though into thin air. Srulik stood wagging his wringing his finger just like his mother did when she was worried or desperate. He didn't know the way home. He looked around as though in a fog. Everything was still the same. The houses and windows on both sides of the street hadn't changed. People continued to walk busily on the sidewalks. The soccer game in the empty lot was still going on. Even he, Srulik, would have looked to someone else like the same boy. Yet inside, he felt as though the bottom had dropped out of himself. He pulled himself together and ran to join the boys playing by the wall.